All right, guys, in this video, we're going to look at a publicly available AP Physics 1 free response question. And the content comes from uh, Unit 1 and Unit 2. So there's going to be a two-dimensional motion projectile problem, a one-dimensional kinematics equation, uh, a multi-object uh, acceleration and net force problem. Uh, and it's kind of all wrapped up in one. So classic college board question. So here we go. Uh, a 0.3 kilogram ball is in a cup of negligible mass attached to a block of mass M that is on a table. So here's our block of mass M. Here's our small cup with a 0.3 kilogram mass inside of there. So as a string passes over a light pulley connects the block to a 2.5 kilogram object as shown hanging off of the pulley. The system is released from rest. The block accelerates to the right, and after moving 0.95 meters, the block collides with a bumper near the end of the table. The ball continues to move and lands on the floor, so it flies out of the cup and lands here, at a position 2.4 meters below and 1.8 meters horizontally from where it leaves the cup. It says, assume all friction is negligible. So part A, A has you calculate the speed of the ball just after the block hits the bumper and the ball leaves the cup. So remember, uh, this system is accelerating. There's a force of gravity in this hanging mass, which is causing this whole system to accelerate. It accelerates over 0.95 meters. It starts from rest. So the ball starts from rest and gains speed, gains speed, gains speed. And once it gets to this bumper, the block stops, but the ball sitting in the cup is free to, like, move and like fly through the air. It's essentially a projectile problem. And so it's asking us essentially like what is the initial launch velocity of this ball if it falls 2.4 meters and travels horizontally 1.8 meters. So remember when we ever, whenever we have a two-dimensional projectile problem you want to think about each part of the motion separately. The horizontal part of the motion in the x-direction and the vertical part of the motion in the y-direction. So we know that while it flies through the air, this is after it hits the bumper, right? It flies through the air. Its horizontal change in position, or delta x, is 1.8 meters. Um, horizontally, we're trying to figure out what its initial horizontal velocity is. Remember that when it's flying through the air, assuming friction is negligible, the object doesn't change its horizontal speed. The acceleration in the x direction is zero. And at this point, we don't know how much time it spends in the air. In the y direction, it, uh, its change in vertical position is negative 2.4 meters because it starts uh, 2.4 meters above the ground and goes down to the ground, so delta y is negative 2.4. In the vertical direction, um, it doesn't have an initial velocity. All of its initial velocity is in the x direction. So the initial velocity in the y direction is zero while it's flying through the air. The force of gravity is the only significant force on it. So its acceleration is negative 10 meters per second per second. So we're essentially given the vertical displacement and the horizontal displacement, and we're solving for the initial horizontal velocity. Well, before we do that, we need to figure out how much time it spends in the air, right? So we either need to use our x direction information or our y direction information to solve for time. So step one is uh, find the time of free fall using your information about the y or the vertical part of the motion. So using this information right here. So if we use this equation, where final y position equals initial y position plus initial velocity times time plus one half times the acceleration in the y direction times time squared. Um, this is essentially what it looks like on your AP equation sheet, except all the y's are replaced with x's. If we subtract the initial position from each side, uh, we get final minus initial position or change in y position. So I've got change in y position equals initial velocity times time plus one half times acceleration in the y direction multiplied by time squared. Remember the initial velocity in the y direction is zero, so this term right here just goes to zero. So we get the simplified form that delta y equals one half a y t squared. Change in the y position is negative 2.4 meters. We plug in our acceleration in the y direction, negative 10 meters per second each second. We can solve for t in this t squared term. If you do the algebra, you find out that time is about 0.7 seconds, which means it takes 0.7 seconds to fall vertically 
2.4 meters and travel 1.8 meters horizontally. So let's now use that time to find that initial horizontal velocity in the x direction. So here's that same equation, but now we've got x's instead of y's. And remember, uh, I would encourage you to make sure you're using the x's, even in the subscripts, to remind you that all the information in this equation has to come from the horizontal part of the motion. L similarly, like we did up here, um, the y's remind you that all of this information, positions, velocities, accelerations, have to deal with the y direction. So in this case, um, this term doesn't go away because it has an initial velocity in, in the x direction. But uh, the acceleration in the x direction, remember, there is no acceleration. The velocity stays constant. There's no significant forces in the x direction, so the acceleration in the x direction is zero. So this whole term, the 1 half at squared, that goes away. That's just zero. So we get a much simpler form that the horizontal change in position is equal to the initial velocity times time. Since we're looking for that initial velocity, let's solve that for vx zero. Divide each side by time. So we get that the horizontal velocity is just equal to just horizontal displacement over time. It traveled 1.8 meters in 0.7 seconds, and so it must have been traveling horizontally at 2.6 meters per second. So that's our answer for part A. Uh, part B asks you to calculate the magnitude of the acceleration of the block as it moves across the table. So let's go back up to our diagram. We're talking about this block. Remember that this block starts with no velocity. It starts from rest, the problem statement said. And so it's going to be this essentially is just a one-dimensional kinematics problem now. We know the initial velocity is zero meters per second. We just found that this block, well, this ball re must have been traveling, remember, in order to go as far as it did. It must have been traveling at 2.6 meters per second. So if the ball was moving at 2.6 meters per second, um, that's because the ball and the block together must have been moving at 2.6 meters per second when it reaches the bumper. So it goes from 0 meters per second to 2.6 meters per second in this displacement, 0.95 meters. Right? We don't know how much time it takes um, because the time that we found was the time that the ball spends in the air, not the time that that block is accelerating. So we just got a simple kinematics problem right here. The final velocity in the x direction is 2.6 meters per second. The initial velocity is 0. We're trying to figure out what the magnitude of the acceleration is, and we know that that happened while well, the block was displaced 0.95 meters. So we can use this kinematics equation. Final velocity squared is equal to initial velocity squared plus 2 times the acceleration times the change in position, or horizontal displacement. So we just plug in the final velocity, the initial velocity, and the displacement. And when we solve for the acceleration, we find that uh, it must have had an acceleration of about 3.6 meters per second each and every second. So those two parts of the problem were really kind of a review of unit one, dealing with one-dimensional and two-dimensional motion. Uh, once we get to C right here, this is really going to be the unit two stuff, dealing with forces and accelerations, uh, specifically with Newton's second law. So remember, in the problem statement, they didn't give us what the mass of this block was. They just said it was mass m. And in part c, they want us to calculate the mass of the block. Well, we know some things about that block, and we know some things about this system. Now, anytime you're thinking about um, the forces involved or the acceleration involved in some kind of system where we have an object on a table, whether it's, there's friction or it's frictionless, and it's attached to another object hanging over a pulley, um, a frictionless pulley with a string, uh, you want to think about not necessarily these things as separate objects, but consider this whole thing one system. Because if they're connected with this, this string and the string is not stretching, well, whatever is happening is happening. That means uh, the mass and the ball on top of it and this hanging mass, it's all kind of accelerating to the right and down. Like they're going to have the same size acceleration, not the direction. Well, if we, if we consider like this, the positive direction, we could say that they're accelerating in the same direction. But treat all three objects like one system of objects. 
So then we can take Newton's second law. Acceleration of an object is equal to the sum of the forces on that one object divided by the mass of that object. Or if we're dealing with some a system of things that are accelerating or changing their velocity, Newton's second law should look like this. The acceleration of a system of objects is equal to the sum of the forces on that system divided by the total mass of that system. Remember, in part B, we found out the acceleration is 3.6 meters per second per second. So we know that value. Uh, if we can figure out the size of the sum of the forces on the system, we should, be, we should be able to solve for the mass of a part of that system, right? So in the numerator here, what is the sum of the forces on this system? Well, there's lots of forces involved, but there's, um, well, let's say we take the, this mass up here and the, the little ball on top is feeling gravitational force, but that's canceled out by the normal force from the table. Um, there's a tension pulling to the right over here, but there's also a tension kind of pulling up the other way on the hanging mass. Those two tensions cancel each other out. The only force that's not balanced out or canceled out by another force is the force of gravity on that hanging mass. So the only force that contributes to the net force or the sum of the forces is the force of gravity on that two and a half kilogram hanging mass which is just its mass times the gravitational field strength. So the sum of the forces on this, the whole system is just 25 newtons. Well, we've got to take that, the sum of the forces, and divide it by the mass of the whole system, which is equal to the sum of the individ three individual masses. So it's the mass on the table plus the uh, little object or ball sitting on top of it, the 0.3 kilograms, plus the mass of the hanging mass, because that 25 newtons is accelerating all of that mass. It's not just accelerating the 2.5 kilogram mass because the string means all this mass is going along for the ride. So we combine the 0.3 and the 2.5 kilograms to get 2.8 kilograms right here. So uh, the right side of this equation looks like this. 25 newtons divided by our unknown mass of the block plus 2.8 kilograms and we know the acceleration of our system found in part B, and so we're kind of bringing these things down here to get this equation. The only unknown is the, the unknown block mass. So uh, if I multiply each side by m plus 2.8, um, I've got it over here, and it cancels out on the right-hand side. So we get 3.6, which is our acceleration, times m plus 2.8 kilograms is equal to 25 newtons. I distribute the 3.6 and end up solving for that mass, and you should get that the mass is about equal to 4.14 kilograms. And that's all using Newton's second law and remembering that we have to treat this thing like a system of accelerating objects. The last part of this question asks, if the mass of the ball is increased, uh, so the mass of the ball sitting on top of this block right here. If the mass of the ball is increased, the horizontal distance it travels before the hitting the floor will decrease. Explain why this happens. So they're saying that if the ball's mass increases, then the horizontal distance the ball will travel will decrease. And so if this mass gets bigger, this 0.3 kilograms, they're saying um, that ball is going to travel less than 1.8 meters. And the question is, well, why does it? travel less than 1.8 meters. Well, we have, we have to kind of go through kind of conceptually explaining all parts A, B, and C to answer this question. So I'm just going to read my response. It says, um, increasing the ball's mass, sitting on top of the block, increases the three object system's mass. Well, the net force in the system is the same. Because remember, the net force is just due to the force of gravity and the hanging mass, and adding more mass up here doesn't change the size of the sum of the forces. So the sum of the forces is still going to be 25 newtons, but it's going to be divided by a larger total system mass because we're increasing this number right here, which means that's going to lead to a smaller system acceleration, right? So this leads to yeah a smaller system acceleration uh, and a smaller final velocity the ball will have when it collides with the bumper. Remember part B? Um, if we have a smaller acceleration here, <clears throat> and that 
is happening over the same 0.95 meter displacement and things start from rest, you're going to end up getting a smaller final velocity if you have a smaller acceleration like that. And if you just go back up to part A, if you have, you know, horizontal displacement is equal to velocity times time, even if the ball has more mass, it's still going to spend the same amount of time in the air because all objects, regardless of mass, feel a vertical acceleration of negative 10 meters per second per second. So time is going to be the same for a larger mass ball, but it's going to have a smaller launch speed because it had a smaller acceleration, because it had a larger total system mass. So therefore, same time, smaller velocity means delta x. How far it's going to travel horizontally before it hit the hits the floor will be smaller. So let me just finish that statement in, in its entirety. So um, the ball's mass increases the total system's mass. When the net force is the same, that leads to a smaller system acceleration and smaller final velocity that the ball will have when it collides with the bumper. With a smaller horizontal launch velocity, it still spends the same time in the air because the acceleration in the y direction is negative 10 meters per second per second regardless of the mass but it will not travel as far horizontally before hitting the floor. Like we said, because the time stays the same and the velocity is smaller.